Good afternoon! How are we doing? Uh, and I've had one bit of advice, and that's from Mark so far, and that's don't be boring. So I'm going to really try not to be boring. Um, uh, who's lost their bag on a plane before? The last wee while? Good, I thought so. I mean, a lot of us fly an awful lot. Um, I lost my bag actually recently uh, in, in Switzerland, and I, fl I flew in uh, somewhere, and I was uh, getting the plane and then getting the train back the same day. I asked the lady at the counter, um, can you not forward on my bag, please? Please don't forward on my bag, because I'm coming back here, I'm going to pass back through here, and then I'm going straight back to New Zealand, and by the time you've forwarded it on, it's found my hotel, then it would have found I've already moved on and gone back to the place, and you'll forever have been, it'll be lost for, for a week or so. And this lovely lady at the counter said to me, sorry, Mr. Johnson, we must forward on your bag. That's our process. And I said to her, well, uh, is there any way we can bend this rule, or bend this process? There must be something we can do. You're physically dealing with the bag. It's a different airline. We're in a different airport. It's a funny situation. Is there anything we can do? And she said, no, no, we'll get my manager and have a chat. So we have a chat with the manager. And eventually, no, we can't do anything with the bag. And eventually, we got quite terse. And uh, she, said, she said, Mr. Johnson, I lose 2,000 bags a day. I think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I said, well, surely this is a process that we should do something about. Um, and anyway, the bag was lost and it eventually arrived back in Christchurch uh, two, two weeks or so later after I was back. Um, but my talk today and what I'm really wanting to cover is a wee bit of a glimpse and a snapshot of this amazing place and this amazing place that, that myself and so many of my friends and colleagues and family live in the South Island of New Zealand. And after talking with a few of you this morning, I know a number of you have been down there. Um, but it's a place that I guess over the last wee while has dramatically changed from one thing to another. It's changed because we've had huge earthquakes in the past four years. Just yesterday was the fourth anniversary, the fourth uh, one-year anniversary of our major earthquake that absolutely decimated the city. And I would just like to take a moment actually just to reflect back and pause to think of our city. One year on, 182 people passed away, a thousand um, buildings gone from the central city and an entire world shattered, 175 years of building shattered in 40 seconds by this, by this earthquake. A lot of us here know New Zealand, we're all getting to, getting to know this beautiful place that we're in and looking at how we build a better future. I think many of us take it for granted, not in this room I'm sure, but around the world, how easily everything can be taken away from you in that sort of time. These are shots that uh, I've seen a thousand times, yet always remember, if you look at the physical change that happened in the very centre of that city, so I just flick back between them, you see the physical change and you can only imagine the emotional change that happened within that time. I was a student actually um, back a few years ago and, and luckily my house in, uh, where, my, where I was flatting, there were 12 of us living in a very small section, all sort of below consent I imagine. It really would have been a great place to have fallen down from the earthquake but um, it, it lives on with probably 15 students living in it now going to the local university. Uh, we were there and, uh, and really we got confronted by the silt that arrived post-earthquake. Um, I got invited to four earthquake after parties on Facebook. And I thought, that's maybe just not quite the thing we should be doing, this earthquake. There's also a guy selling a t-shirt saying, uh, I survived the Christchurch earthquake for $35. And so I created a Facebook page, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much today, but it's the background and the backdrop of this incredible platform that myself and my colleagues and, and team members over the past four years have managed to create and co-create a movement of, of um, young people responding to whatever they see in the community, responding to needs that are out there and responding to what we come across. We found the silt, the silt that arrived, uh, it, it really just, we had no idea that Christchurch was having such a huge earthquake. Um, and, and basically, our Facebook page, I invited 200 friends to it, a mix of the really popular kids at uni who were you know, you know, all the good-looking ones, all the lots of friends, um, and, and invited them, invited the people I knew whose parents had a bit of money so they could pay for the thing, and, and a group of people I just knew would turn up with a shovel and help out. And that turned into about 27,000 people on Facebook and 11,000 volunteers who came out to the streets of Christchurch. And so within a two-week period, there's myself and a core team of 15 of us, a couple of different organizations joined us, 
to help manage this huge mass of people that wanted to contribute and, and wanted desperately to help, but felt they didn't have permission to help. And so today, actually, what I want to focus on most and what I've sort of spent the last four years and what I want to spend the next 10 years on, on is how do we change the way New Zealand culture and cultures around the world look at permission and the sense of confidence, sorry, sorry, confidence and sense of permission. Confidence to be who you are and permission to do whatever it is that you want to do. So our group, and, and, and to summarize what happened, you'd turn up in the morning, you would give them a shovel, would give them a dust mask, would give them the lunch, they'd get, go, walk outside, they'd get given a team leader, they'd walk onto a bus, they'd go out to the suburbs of Christchurch, they'd hop off the bus, get given an old person, very important, and then get, get on down into the street and, and go and just shovel the silt. All of these students, three quarters of our university, went out to help out. And as we went out onto the streets, we thought we were the ones who were quite incredible because we were out there helping. But actually, they helped us more than we helped them. We wanted to contribute and we needed to contribute to this time. For me, though, and the last couple of years particularly, is looked at disasters around the world. I spent some time up in Japan after the tsunami there and uh, was spent some time with an amazing guy, Toshiro Wakana. I've told his story thousands of times. He was standing at his door when the earthquake hit and he said to his elderly mum, we need to get upstairs, we need to get away. His mum had dementia, didn't know what was going on, didn't realise the risk that his village faced to disasters or the fact that actually 70% uh, of the world's population live in areas prone to natural disasters and half the disasters that could occur in the world haven't happened yet. She said, no, we don't need to get away, it's okay, we'll just wait under the door for another earthquake, unaware that tsunami was about to attack them. He couldn't get the door open, couldn't get the window open, eventually did get the window open. He was pulling his auntie through the window because the door wouldn't, wouldn't open because the frame was all, all skew with. And he looked out and just saw this wall of water flying towards him. Flew towards him and he, he ran up his stairs and stood at the back of his house for four or five hours while the wall of water just completely decimated you know, his entire existence. After that time, he came back down and chest height water, and I remember it so vividly, him explaining it to us. There's black water, and there's sort of just cars sprinkled around everywhere, and there's a car in a swimming pool right by where we were staying. And put your hand in the swimming pool, and the water is so black. We really didn't know what to, what to do, but he had this amazing sense of, of, um, of this amazing resilience, but sense of destiny. That whatever it is we go through, we have to then reflect back on that and just deal with it as wherever we can. And so despite the disaster, he had this ability to look back on and lead his entire community in Ashinomaki in Japan through a recovery for a couple of years in an area where no government help, no aid help was going to. So I guess the thing for me and likes of him, and if I reflect back there to the farmers who came and helped out in Christchurch, the Farmy Army, as, we, as they became known, the farmers and all these people who came into town to help out the city folk, I remember saying to an old guy once at the end of a, end of a day, uh, will you come back tomorrow? And he said, yeah, young man, if um, you put those 10 young ladies with me, I'll come back every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> and so I was a wee bit, a bit, a bit miffed about what's the motivation for people coming to help out here. Um, but the basic fact was everyone wanted to contribute. Amazing that a Facebook page was as simple as it was to mobilize a whole lot of people around it and around this cause. So over the last four years, we've looked back on actually, well, what was the success of it? There's been a lot of studies done, a lot of people thought, how did these students self-organize? And many people in this room, you know, it's nothing really revolutionary. Call to action, people responded. You go out and do it, and you kind of make it up along the way. With our, um, our experience sort of has taught us, though, that it's the identity capital that drives these movements. And whether it's little movements in New Zealand or ones overseas, it's the identity of some of the core people involved that really drives it, that galvanizes people around it. So the six people who join me, our collective identities, and they're the wider 15, the wider 70, the wider 11,000, were able to drive this movement and completely shatter the stereotype of young people in New Zealand. And if we think back four years ago, the young perception of students in New Zealand was couch burning, drunken um, louts, basically. And we still have good parties, don't worry. And they're great, and we still burn couches in Dunedin, it's fun. But the point is, we completely changed the way an entire nation looked at an issue. 
What's more interesting than that, though, for me, and particularly following Peter's um, talk this morning, is the way institutions in New Zealand respond to social movements. We've already seen that today with the way that institutions such as NZ Trade and Enterprise have responded to this gathering happening here today. The University of Canterbury has completely changed its, its student profile and what it hopes every graduate walks out with because of the student army. They've created new courses, they're, they're reforming the law school around service and, and voluntary contribution because it's such an important part of Christchurch. But the challenge with it, and I think as we look at these, some of these institutions on the page here, how do we mobilize, catalyze more people to have the sense of confidence and permission to respond to what they come across? How do we then encourage them to lead so that the institutions can follow? As I think of some of the debate this morning, it's happening, but what can we do more about it? What, what more can happen to get institutions to follow the people? It's the trend that's happening, and it's, um, and it's a look to this, this photo here, which I love, and it, um, excuse the quality of it, but it's, uh, as you know, CERN, the, um, the, the Hydron um, Collider in Switzerland. And the fact that that, was cut, that idea was born by some scientists to stop the brain drain to America. And then they put billions of dollars towards it each year, and I hope it might work, but no idea if it will or not. New Zealand, for me, is a place that, it's a place where ideas can really flourish. You can come up with an idea and build a team around you very, very quickly and test something out. Something Peter also mentioned this morning that our team are working on at the moment is the, around small states. I think it's a theme to be explored a lot deeper around our ability as a very small nation in the world to align with other small states to drive some really interesting change. If you're an entrepreneur in Auckland, why not test your, test your idea in, in Tel Aviv and Helsinki and then go, go wide instead of looking straight to America or China? And I think in New Zealand at the moment, we have this incredible, I love or hate them, government. Very, very powerful government. But they're going to, and they can, with encouragement, bring the left, the green elements right in there and drive that over the next three or four years while they'll probably still be in power. And it's big movements in New Zealand that will do that for me. And so I think there's, um, there's, there's something we created in Christchurch after the earthquakes, and it was called the Ministry of Awesome. And in response to ministries maybe not being so awesome all the time. And Ministry of Awesome is about being a starting point. The starting point for whatever it is that you want to do. For people who would never dream or know that this sort of forum ever exists. A lady from Shirley last week who, who is, has a beautiful lampshade business. I was selling them for $25 on our equivalent of eBay. A couple of connections made in a city growing and she's suddenly got a whole income for her family. The Ministry of Awesome has this thing about watering the seeds of awesome in communities in New Zealand. Our dream in the next 10 years is to have a million people through the Ministry of Awesome to talk to them about the way that they can be awesome and create their own awesome from within them. But one of the things that underpins it and one of the things that I think underpins New Zealand culture at the moment that we should focus on is that New Zealand doesn't have a written constitution. And only last year and the year before, the government led a review of that constitution. There's a lot more we can do there. There's a lot more ideas that need to be espoused in New Zealand and a lot more people mobilized to make a real impact. So with our little crew in Christchurch, for us, it's a lot about courage, courage to do things quite differently and really uniting these people who have very strong social capital to continue their journey. If you're ever in Christchurch, um, I'd love to show you around and show you this great place we've got as we're rebuilding a city and a rebuilding a city that right now is in all four phases of recovery, of, of response to disaster, of recovery, of reconstruction. Nine hundred people last year were still found with tarpaulins over their toilets and whatnot. But actually, the trouble down there, we can't find out who needs help. The trouble in New Zealand, I think, is a parallel. We can't have it. We don't have enough people who are really prepared to stick their head up and put out these new ideas and have these conversations about different ways of operating, in a politically, sort of an apolitical uh, standpoint. 
So I'm really curious as to a group like this, and I want to finish with that sort of question. What are the ideas that people like myself, who I found myself in a leadership position at the age of 25, now I'm just turned 26, what are, the, what are some of the other things we can really drive in this country? And how do we work better with international partners to, to really do that, to leverage these ways, leverage our connections of a small country, the fact we don't have a constitution, and the fact that institutions are following what we do? How do we be more ambitious as a collective to do that? It's a really exciting time for me and for us, for us all going forward. Thanks so much. Reflections and questions. Yosef's looking directly at me. <laughs> I just want to say, you have to visit Christchurch. Yeah. You really, really have to go visit Christchurch and see the work that Sam and all the people of the city have done to bring the spirit back alive and keep the momentum to rebuild something, but also create something that wasn't existing before. There's a whole art renaissance going on there. There's a spirit of creativity that's just been opened up. Um, you really have to go see it. Thanks, Joseph. More questions and reflections? Hey, Sam. <clears throat> I'm curious just if you could go into a little bit more depth about what the nature of the response was. Mm. Um, you know, you, there's sort of, you, you sort of touched on the emotional side of, hey, there was just this outpouring of energy. Everybody wanted to help. Uh, you know, you talked about the Facebook page. What what other systems did did you guys figure out that that maybe helped in creating the rebuild and being effective, and that that maybe other communities could learn from mm. from your experience? Yeah, sure. So um, the the technology we used to respond was was very simple, very basic, and it wasn't anything that couldn't be recreated straight away if there was another disaster. I think it's interesting to look at um, the, the policies in New Zealand around disaster um, response and how they, res how, how they have f followed and how they've learned. And actually, in a large sense, there's a lot of them that haven't followed um, the natural intuition of the, of the communities in the way they responded. So despite all different communities mobilising and going out, policymakers have found it really hard to translate that energy into something they can try and recreate again. With our group, um, it was as, as simple as going out and helping. Where, where it's fallen down, I think, is in, in how do we stay involved in a rebuild when it gets more complex, when it is the adults that take over as such. And the only way, and one of the only ways has been uh, different protests and movements and sort of soft diplomacy to try and get, get your ideas through. I think we've still got this opportunity as we look at disasters across the country. How would we respond again? How would you rebuild again? We all want like a, a really green, healthy, positive, happy city in Christchurch. But how do you unite the different people and different factions to try and get that to happen? Uh, so there's a, I mean, there's a lot more work there to happen, but it, um, yeah. The structure that we're in today, this dome, uh, came from Christchurch City. This was actually um, sent down to Christchurch immediately after the quake and was one of the first structures set up in the emergency response. And then uh, after they've made some progress, they no longer needed the dome. And so we're just sitting in storage uh, before this event. So just to kind of tell you a little story about this space. Yeah, it's really ch changed the whole dynamic in Christchurch. They brought these things in, and they were, f for a start, that they were the triage just where all the bodies were taken into. Uh, and then they became these wonderful venues with all these concerts at, with, with musicians and, and artists and, and everything else that really drove the, drove the future of our, of, our, of our little city down there. So it's a cool space. So. Matthew. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. That was great. Um, one thing that strikes me is just... I think a lot of us in this room have a shared belief that the climate crisis upon us is is going to get worse before it gets better, and and that there's going to be more of these natural disasters um, globally. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you you talked about starting points and the importance of starting points, and I think you know we share this sentiment that there, there's a a starting point that happens in a disaster for new forms of organization, new forms of culture to emerge, new forms of community. Uh, as well as technologies and tools and sustainable building and so forth. And so 
in response to your inquiry of how do we how do we create global alliances and partnerships and, and where do we go from here, I just think that the work you're doing in terms of uh, mobilizing youth towards rebuilding in response um, is is something that can be globally applied as a pattern mm -hmm. and can have such a, a phenomenal impact and you seem like the perfect steward of that message and, and storyteller of that message everywhere in the world. Cool. Thanks so much. I think it's great. In the last uh, year, a team's worked with you and ISDR on movement of young people in disasters around the world. And out of all the different UN climate um, ne negotiations going on, the HuffPost recently called the disaster risk reduction one, uh, the one that no one knows about, but the one that's working. Because it really has such tangible on the ground things. The challenge though we face in New Zealand is how do you encourage, encourage those frameworks to really have application at businesses on a really local level at home. Uh, and also to, I mean, the way we, we've coined it to a lot of government people, particularly on the centre right, is talk about climate change as disaster risk reduction. Don't talk about it as climate change. Don't mention the C words. What we do, and what I try to do, is talk about disaster risk reduction and climate change to mid-Canterbury farmers, the most conservative, people like my dad, who would really not believe in what a lot of the, the, the fluff he would say that, that I'm involved in. But when we talk about it as a sort of everyday thing that you need to prepare for as well, it's much more accessible, it's more, much more complex than the left and right divide. That actually is a, something that's inherently built into New Zealand culture at the moment, that hopefully we can move beyond in the next 10 years. I find myself curious about two things, Sam. One is, um, you know, have you, um, I'm sure you have, made attempts to sort of leverage the goodwill that must have accrued towards all of your efforts with the bureaucracy in place um, to help get yourself a, a seat at the table sort of in terms of their future rebuilding efforts. And the other was, as you've traveled to other disaster places in the world, are there lessons that you found to bring home that are applicable um, as you plan and look towards the future? Yeah, sure, uh, great question, an interesting point. Uh, so I think just on the second part, um, there's, there's a lot that we bring home and uh, I think there's a lot more we can bring home. Uh, we do have this culture in New Zealand where, oh, let's, let's create world be best practice. Uh, disasters have happened since, since the beginning of time, so bringing those lessons I think is something we can still do better at. Um, and in terms of our learning outwards, uh, it's a lot about the individual responding and, and a lot of the challenges we face is on getting beyond the barriers of having a certain qualification. And that was faced in Christchurch a lot. Do you have the right qualification? Does that get you the seat at the table? And how do we encourage our leaders to recognize that l the legitimacy of power and from new places? And that's been a huge struggle in Christchurch. And then often it's, it happens and then it's, uh, it's somewhat token. So we have to be careful around that as well, so yeah. Hey Sam, hey. Uh, love the energy, um, love all the passion. Um, one thing that really jumps out to me is the um, energy that can be built around uh, movements, movements that people find meaningful, movements that uh, align with people's values. Um, and I think that is something that can bring people in and going from this previous talk with Trade Enterprise, um, when you're, tr like what they were kind of framing was how do you sell a country? How yeah. do you sell New Zealand? Um, and I think there's a possibility or a chance that it goes sort of one step further. And it's not that you're selling like New Zealand as a country. Like the, the more time that I've spent traveling and meeting people, the more I come across really intelligent young people who have a much more global, globally minded Mindset. view of the world. And they seem sort of global citizens. Yeah. And they're not so much looking for a country to align with. You know, it's not like I, I want to move to this country because I align totally with, with a country because I think we're all kind of realizing that the, there isn't just like one country that we totally align with with all our values. But if New Zealand can be the, like, when you're selling New Zealand, it's not that you're selling, New Zealand's not just a country, but it can be like a movement. It can be, it can be a way of living. It can be a way of being. Mm. And then you can attract in all of these amazing gifted minds to come somewhere to work on things that they find meaningful and they believe in. And then you're incubating a whole lot of talent, talent and producing a whole lot of innovative technologies. But I think is a theme that is being, mm. that's the whole kind of point I feel of the, all these conversations that we're having. Uh, no, I, 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 yeah. yeah. 
I very much agree, and actually, so the idea I mentioned briefly about the movement of entrepreneurs or whatever it is, but businesses between small countries, and I'm not a startup guy, I don't know a lot about that, um, but our theory is if, if, you're, if you're a young Kiwi, you often go off to England because that's our sort of got this hangover, let's go to England for two years and have a, vi a, a visa exchange structure there is very open and appreciative, and you learn, but we come back with the same ideas. I think long term what we need is almost like a new commonwealth of countries maybe who are small and small and powerful in their own ways. And our entrepreneurial idea is, is the very seed of that. That If you have a much better connection between uh, security and, and economically similarly, similar countries, but they're geographically um, not located together, you can actually do some wonderful things. You've got these powerhouses around the world with a lot in common. Our governments are in common. The legal structures are in common. But we don't really talk together that much. So we've got a lot more to do in that space, I think. Which is exactly plays on your point. And New Zealand, I think internationally, must be a leader in that. Yeah. And be much more vocal. It's not a fast follower, it's a leader. Yeah. The young people and communities in New Zealand are, sh are saying we want to be leaders. Yeah. And, and it is about saying to, the, to, to our institutions as well, we want you to be actively leading on climate issues, on, on fossil fuel issues. So, and I think we can do it here. So that's the exciting part. Mm. Yeah. So just finally, Mark's been putting up his hand and I know that he had some strict um, guidance for you not to be boring and I'm wondering if he's going to comment on that or something else. I'm intrigued. <laughs> uh, I think Sam... I've had the privilege to know this young man since the earthquakes. Um, you've yet again managed to avoid being tedious, Sam. So, <laughs> first thing But there's a serious point here. Peter this morning was talking about the shadow side of this culture of ours. And the question I'm going to throw to you, Sam, is that, I mean, I have a, a blessed life and that I spend half my life out of this country, and it's a privilege. And God protect us from the zealots, be they the madrasas in Pakistan or the Bible Belt in America, wherever. God protect us from the earnest who fail to have a sense of humour, but also, Sam, God protect us from the beige, <laughs> from those without duende, without passion. So my question to you, Sam, is exactly the one you've just picked up. How do we in this culture break through and enable mom and pop here to really embrace the kind of leadership that you are calling for and your generation is demanding mm -hmm. so that we can start to look at this idea of the incubator nation that Matt and, and Yosef and so on. So can I throw that e mm. easy challenge at you? Mm. What, are, what are the steps to get the adults, so-called, the business-as-usual adults, out of the bloody way? Mm. You know? Yeah. I think you did right around demanding that and we need to be more vocal about that there is a lot more uh, a lot more voice that needs to go to the debate particularly from the younger generations to politically um, for me though it really does come back to those two things around confidence and sense of permission how do we restructure the education system so people do have more confidence in their own ideas and, and how do we get over the hangover that you need particular a particular career progression to be successful and, and it's, the, the literature and the debates are all out there, and I can't argue them all. Um, though the other ones we need to embrace here more, more freely. And I think it's a really good step about telling stories. Peter telling the New Zealand story today is a start, but what's the individual stories we're telling within New Zealand? And, and why do we compete against each other? And even from Christchurch between Auckland, we have this sort of, oh, no, Auckland, it's a big city, but you know, we should be as a nation looking out and not just to the states in China, but looking out to, to the whole ASEAN region and then the Pacific, and really acknowledging where we've come from there. Uh, and I think so education has a huge role to play for me, but also just in absolutely nurturing and supporting the people who are driving it already. You, could, you and I could probably name a hundred in the country who are really doing it. Rebecca Mills, my dear friend, who's the one who introduced, introduced me to this forum and, and really has mentored myself and a whole lot over the last years, Rebecca spends a huge amount of her time doing that, as you do, Mark. And I think that's the key. It's actually nurturing and supporting these people. And, and like myself, four years ago, I had no idea that I would ever be able to do some of the things we've done in the last four years. We need more of that mentoring and support, though, to actually help them get to the, the, sec the second, second part. So, and, and Carl, as well, I want to acknowledge for that and the mentoring. So, mm. Thanks, Sam. Um,
one more question, then we'll break for lunch. And thank you very much for acknowledging our, our great relationship, which is growing over the years. That was very inspiring. Thank you. Love the Ministry of Awesome. Um, <laughs> I want to just um, recommend a book called Resilience Thinking to, to everybody, actually, and it has a whole suite of case histories. Not it, It's a combination of biology or ecology and, and sociology. But one of the points they make is basically what you find communities that are resilient, what it comes down to is social ties. Social ties save lives, mm -hmm. quite literally. So everything that you're doing here is completely on point in terms of engaging community in that way. Uh, but one other tool that's used um, that can be profoundly transformational is scenario planning. Mm -hmm. And most people don't really think about the future at all to begin with, or they think of it incrementally just as an extension of the present, not the kind of disruption that we're talking about here, both externally imposed or internally generated. And um, so it can be something that, you know, once you open up, well, what kind of future do we want? Is it future A, B, C, D? It, and it's a fantastic engagement tool. So what you're talking about, it gets people to f recognize their own assumptions, um, f which is the very first step in moving outside of that and then opens up many possibilities for engagement um, and creativity and participation. So um, anyway, it's a great social technology. Well, thanks very much for that. Yeah. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah. Round of applause for Sam Johnson. <laughs>